Hello and welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman alongside Josh Lipton, live from our New York City headquarters. You're watching the debut of our brand new show. It's aimed at giving you, the viewers, the ultimate investing playbook. We'll help you tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. From today's top stories to Yahoo Finance's trending tickers to the macroeconomic forces shaping markets, we'll dig deeper into everything you need to know for that last hour of trading. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. What a moment um, to be here talking about this when we're 5% off of all time high. I mean, in, in some ways, this is inevitable. More people want to own it than are willing to sell it. Therefore, the, the, the price is going up. Long term, it would have been a better deal, but both carriers are going to be able to prosper very well going forward. The consumer is really the one that loses here. We've all identified NVIDIA as the clear AI leader. Um, I guess in, in this sort of uh, instantaneous market, they're almost yesterday's news in terms of AI. And Micron is the, uh, is the top pick on the DRAM space for us. Those are the top stories of the day we'll be covering as we've got one hour to go until the market closed. Josh and I are joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the market action. I'm going to kick it off by taking a look at the major indices and some other asset classes that we're watching. A pause today from the big upward momentum we have seen um, for the past 16 of 18 weeks in the S&P 500, which have been higher. Any higher close today would be another record close for the S&P as well as for the Nasdaq Composite, which is barely in the green right now. We've got Russell 2000, which has been out performing up four tenths of one percent and got to give a shout out to Bitcoin here which has been seeing a continuation of its monster rally above 67,000 today and getting closer to a record. Now let's send it over to Jared for a closer look at today's sector action. Thank you, Julie. We have been tracking utilities and real estate. Those are two interest rate sensitive sectors that happen to be at the top of the board today. But we're also seeing some gains in materials. That's XLB, industrials, tech and financials. That rounds out the top line there. To the downside, we are tracking some losses in communication services and consumer discretionary, especially Tesla, weighing that sector down. Now, we're also seeing some movement when I when I dig into our leaders and sentiment markets. Bitcoin, as Julie said, that is by far and away the biggest sector of the day. Uh, that is close to a record high, closing in on 69,000, uh, but also tracking some strength in semiconductors. You can see a lot of green on your screen here. Contrast that with the amount of red that we see in software. So a little bit of a, a bifurcation when you take a look at what's going on in the tech sector. Josh? Well, Jared, I'm watching Apple for two reasons here today. One, we had news today on Apple, and important news. The European Commission nailing Apple with a big $2 billion fine. The allegation here is that the iPhone maker drove up music streaming costs for iOS users. Now, Apple is appealing, and we're we'll going to talk a lot more about this story later in the show and what it means for investors. There's a broader reason to watch Apple, too, though. You know, that stock is down today again. In fact, it is now down about 10% so far this year. Used to be Apple was thought of as a true bellwether. So goes Apple, so goes the market. That's what at least a lot of investors thought. It was really considered kind of its own asset class, but now things seem to be changing here. Uh, investors are clearly more confident and optimistic about this market and, and willing to shake off some of the underperformance we are seeing in the iPhone maker, Julie. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is part of the reason why the Magnificent 7 is not really the Magnificent 7 anymore, right? right? Apple is a big part of that, Tesla as well, that we have seen this divergence in performance in a lot of those names. For sure. That was, you know, an important storyline. People used to think, listen, Mark, Magnificent 7 has to move higher right. for the market to move higher. Magnificent 7, as you point out, not so magnificent. Not all of them, no. no. All right, let's zoom out once again. Stocks a little changed as the markets put the recent record-setting ra setting rally on pause. But with 79% of the S&P 500 trading above their 200-day moving averages, our first guest today calls this a broadening bull market. For more, let's welcome in Urian Timmer, Director of Global Macro at Fidelity Investments. Urian. It is a pleasure to see you. It's been a minute, so thanks so much for joining us. Um, so we were just talking about the Magnificent Seven themselves, and of course, continued strength in some of those names, like NVIDIA, is notable. There have been calls for a while for the rally to broaden. Are we finally seeing signs of that? And what does that mean then for the sustainability of the rally overall? Yes, um, nice to see you as well. So yes, my, my theme has been a bullish broadening, and the market is broadening. You know, the, my favorite 
in index actually to look at right now is the S&P 500 equal weighted index, SPW. Uh, obviously, we all know the cap weighted index that started making new all time highs uh, earlier this year in around mid January. The equal weighted index is still a fraction of a percent below its all time highs, which means that it's been in some form of limbo now for two years and two months, which is a very long time for the stock market not to trend to new highs. Uh, but at the same time, 79% of stocks in the S&P are above their 200-day moving average. So that's pretty, pretty broad. And uh, if you think about kind of the juxtaposition of where we are in this cycle, uh, the market's gained 46% from its October 2022 low. Uh, by historical standards, that's still kind of a baby in terms of bull markets. You know, bull markets tend to be good for at least 60, 70 percent and sometimes 100, 120, 150 percent. Uh, so at 46 percent, it's still a young bull market. But uh, last year, only 26 percent of stocks in the S&P outperformed the S&P. So I think the market it has been broadening. It is broadening. I think the the broad market will follow with new all time highs. You know, very very soon. The big question that we don't have an answer to is whether the broad market will outperform the Magnificent Seven. Uh, but I do think it will at least participate. You know, the, the generals tend to lead, and they they were making new highs in January. The soldiers are now following, and I think they will will make new highs fairly soon. You know, you're in another storyline that kind of has shifted a bit. I want to get your take on it as, you know, we talked about Mag Magnificent Seven, but another storyline seemed to be, at least a lot of investors seem to think, listen, the Fed needs to cut early and often for this market to move high. But now what we see investors actually really kind of tempering their forecasts here of both when the Fed will cut and how deeply, and yet still the market moves higher. How, what do you make of that dynamic? Yes, uh, I, th that's a very good observation. And, you know, the market, I think, was always a little bit over its skis expecting, you know, six plus rate cuts from the Fed like this year. I mean, that would only happen in a recession, and we're pretty far from a recession right now. The Fed indicated itself at its December FOMC meeting that three rate cuts would be appropriate, and I think that's correct, right? Because inflation is moving lower. The core PCE is now at 2.8%, uh, which is a far cry from the 5.6% at its peak. So the Fed needs to cut rates somewhat just to keep pace with that, right? Because, you know, Fed policy should be measured in real terms. So if inflation moves down and the Fed funds rate does not move down, then in real terms, the Fed actually would be getting more restrictive, which is not appropriate um, at this point. But, you, you know, you indicated something important, which is that the market doesn't seem to be quite as focused anymore on, you know, how soon and how many rate cuts. And that's because earnings are starting to do the heavy lifting now. So if you think about valuation of the stock market, you know, the discounted cash flow model, valuation is the present value of future cash flows uh, or earnings. And last year, earnings fell ever so slightly by two and a half percent. But when there is no earnings growth, um, the, the denominator of the discounted cash flow model, interest rates, become very important. So the market becomes obsessed with uh, how you know restrictive or how accommodative the Fed gets because you don't have that earnings cushion uh, to support the market. Now earnings are growing. You know, we're just wrapping up fourth quarter earnings season and the growth rate is about 8%. So that's pretty good. And when that happens, um, the interest rate part of the DCF model uh, is still important, but it becomes a little bit less important because earnings are doing the heavy lifting. And I think that's why we're hearing less of a focus on, you know, how quickly will the Fed cut and how many times. That, that makes sense, Yuri. And so the economy is growing. The market's not that worried about cuts right now. Earnings are growing enough to fuel the continued gains. What are you worried about? <laughs> what could, you know, I mean, we've been almost in a straight line up. I mean, there have been some little fits and starts, but, you know, record after record, particularly in tech, but in the overall averages as well. Is there anything that could stop it? Well, one thing that um, I don't know if it's a concern, but it's worth uh, pointing out, and that is that valuations are, uh, you know, not at an extreme, but they're they're fairly rich, right? The the trailing PE, uh, so using trailing earnings is 23 times um, 
and the forward PE using the next 12 month earnings is at 21. And you know that that's fairly normal for the PE to be elevated uh, at a point in the cycle where the market is anticipating an earnings recovery. So price always moves ahead of the fundamentals. The market's always anticipating the future, not always correctly, but it is always anticipating. So the last year plus of um, price gains have been fueled by PE gains because the earnings side wasn't sort of kicking in. Now that the earnings are kicking in, I think the PE can sort of start to level off here without it meaning that the market has to go down. Uh, but you know, at 20 times, 21 times forward earnings, um, I wouldn't say the market's priced for perfection, but there is not that much margin for error. So if earnings were to disappoint, uh, the market might be over its skis a little bit. But fortunately, it looks like earnings are coming through. But again, uh, there is less margin for error when valuations are high than when they are low. And they are on the high side. And that means that that baton pass from PE-driven gains to earnings-driven gains uh, needs to happen. And I think that will happen uh, in the coming months. Uh, we'll be watching that margin of error closely, though. Yuri, and thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're just getting started here on market domination. Coming up, Bitcoin price is surging toward an all-time high. We'll speak with Skybridge founder Anthony Scaramucci about the latest rally, what's next for crypto, and much more on the other side. Plus, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around, more market domination still to come.
Bitcoin ripping higher today again. It's surpassing 67,000. It's up more than 50% over the last month. Our next guest says that Bitcoin is the Berkshire Hathaway of the 21st century. For more on the crypto landscape, we're bringing in Anthony Scaramucci, Skybridge founder and managing partner. Anthony, it's great to see you. I believe that's something that you tweeted about the Berkshire Hathaway comparison. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure how Warren Buffett would feel about that comparison. But well, he, uh, I'm he, just curious what led you to make that. Well, I mean, Julie, you know me a long time. It's a bit provocative. It would sure. upset all the trade. It would upset all the trade five people, uh, but it would have for, it would fortunately uh, force a discussion so that we could explain to people that we are now fully in a digital world, and this is a value store. And I think of Berkshire Hathaway as a value storage uh, company. I'm a long term holder of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Twenty seven years I've held that stock. Uh, of course, it served me very well. And I think Bitcoin is something that people need to think about in terms of uh, multiple decade holding. So uh, that, that's where the comparisons are. But yes, I mean, trade fight people wouldn't like that. I think Mr. Buffett, I know Charlie Munger hated Bitcoin and Mr. Buffett's called it rat poison. But I have typically found that people that are not focusing on it and are not doing the deep dive homework feel that way. Uh, but after you do the homework on it, uh, you sort of fall into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, and it's a one-way ticket towards Bitcoin. I, I know very few analysts that have actually taken the time to understand Bitcoin, and then I said, oh, okay, you know, that's that's not for me. I've yet to find somebody like that. Anthony, it's great to have you on the show. Let me get your take, Anthony, on what you see is kind of driving the rally we're seeing here. You know, is it strictly Anthony? You know, new ETF inflows or or other factors at work? So. Great to see you too, Jazz. I think I think what's happening, uh, not to be overly simplistic, is that you have a limited supply, and you have a very wild amount of demand right now. Now it's interesting. A lot of people are trying to figure out where the demand is coming from. Is this retail demand, or is it institutional demand? Our best guess, based on an analysis, that it's still being retail driven, although there are now pockets of institutional investors that are coming in. You know, we have reason to believe that there's more than one sovereign wealth fund now uh, in the Bitcoin story, buying Bitcoin, either buying it through the ETFs or buying it and holding it in a secure wallet. So uh, you just don't have enough Bitcoin out there. There's not enough Bitcoin on the exchanges. Uh, and of course, not to bore people, I'm happy to explain the halving cycle if you have time. But just the point is, uh, sometime in mid to late April, arguably April 20th, uh, the network is spitting out 900 coins a day. That gets cut in half to 450. And so that will once again decrease supply at a time where there's a lot of demand for it. So, you know, the Skybridge intrinsic value model at this point is about 110,000. Uh, we do think that this will get to 170,000. Uh, uh, four quarters after the halving. So, uh, you know, people think we're nuts and that's fine, but I don't think we're nuts. And that's why we have such a big position. Um, and Anthony, you know, how powerful do you think is also kind of just the feeling that retail <laughs> investors get in because, as I wrote recently, number go up because they think, it, it, I mean, it's price chasing, it's FOMO, it's whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. that people feel like they're going to get rich by putting money in this thing. Well, listen, Julie, we both know market psychology and human psychology, and I'm, I'm certain that there's a large segment of the population that's just doing that, and they're, 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 they're chasing it. But then there's another segment of the population, which would include people like Kathy Wood or Tim Draper, uh, people like Paul Tudor Jones, that have done an enormous amount of homework on Bitcoin and understand its network effects and understand that as it scales, and we're only at about 5% adoption, which puts us roughly at 1999 for Web 1. And so those people that have really done the fundamental homework on this thing know that as it scales uh, and it gets adopted, it becomes this hard asset. Uh, it becomes a form of digital gold. And again, I'm not saying it becomes the world's reserve currency. There are Bitcoin ma maximalists that believe that. All Skybridge is suggesting is that it should trade to the market capitalization of gold. Uh, Bitcoin's at about 
you know, 1.3 trillion right now. Gold is roughly 14 trillion. Could Bitcoin be 10 times uh, where it is today? We believe that it could be. It'll probably take six to 10 years to get there. Uh, and so, yes, I hear you. There's short-term people in there. There's loose holders. Um, I watched with amazement in January, uh, loose holders of Bitcoin selling their Bitcoin to the likes of BlackRock and other large-scale ETFs uh, in the high 30s, low 40s. And I would just caution people that understood the Bitcoin story or who have accidentally gotten into the Bitcoin story to stay patient. Anthony, on the flip side, man, patience can hurt sometimes, can it? You know that very well from the dip that we saw in crypto, right? The whole FTX situation, which I know uh, you were uh, invested in to some extent as well. So how do you invest in this thing knowing that, okay, maybe it goes to 170, but then does it go back to 15 or you know what have you? In other words, it's it's a volatile asset. It's a good it's a good question. I would I would say this to you that we took a lot of heat when our Bitcoin position rolled over. We made our first Bitcoin purchases in November of 2020 between 17 and 19,000. Uh, they got up to 69,000. They round tripped back to 17,000. Uh, we went from heroes to uh, dunces over that period of time. Uh, I don't think we're that smart or that dumb. I just think that this is an early adopting technological asset, only 5% saturation. And so concomitant with that, Julie, is a lot of volatility. I would take people back to the early days of Google, Facebook, early days of Amazon. You know, we saw Amazon lose 50% of its value eight times. And in one time in the 2000 tech bubble debacle, it lost 90% of its value. So these things are volatile. I tell investors and clients, own a small piece of this. This is not something you have to own 20% of your portfolio in, but if you had a 1% to 3% position, I think you'd end up doing very well. And I think it would reward you uh, because run a regression analysis, it's a non-correlated asset. And I think over time, it will prove to be a non-correlated asset in the future. And Anthony, we're talking Bitcoin here, but I want to switch to another subject you're very familiar with, which is politics. Um, you know, you're, you're not a never Trumper, Anthony, clearly. I mean, you worked for Trump, but you, you yeah, don't. Yeah, people say, yeah, exactly. Yep. But you don't want him in, in the White House again, right? Um, so I'm interested, though, Anthony, are you therefore suggesting that you think Biden, if he was back for a second term, that would be a positive for Bitcoin? Okay, so there's a lot of different things there, okay? So we're talking specifically for Bitcoin. I think macro, yes, uh, because whether you like Mr. Biden or dislike him, he's for the rule of law and he's for the democratic processes of the United States. Last time I checked, he didn't try to insurrect the American government after losing an election and he wasn't caught on tape trying to do that. Uh, and so I know that trial is going to be delayed, but the American people need to know the facts, you know, Mark Meadows, uh, the former White House chief of staff and a conservative member of the House Freedom Caucus, is the chief witness against former President Trump. So to me, I tell Bitcoiners, you are at risk if you get somebody that wants to destroy the institutions of the democracy, the separation of powers in the Constitution. The country has been made great. It is great. It doesn't need to be made great again. It is great and is primarily great because of the traditions in the country, the democracy, the flat decentralized system of government at the top. You get Mr. Trump in there, he's made it very, very clear that he wants to persecute journalists that don't like him. He wants to pull FCC licenses of people that are critical. He said he's ready to empower the Department of Justice and go after his political adversaries. He's made all of this very clear. And he's also on tape saying, hey, uh, I'd like to stay in power. Let's see if we can flip this somehow. Uh, and of course, they've got his attorneys on tape conspiring to create fraudulent electors in the Electoral College. So I know he's on a good run right now. I understand politics reasonably well. Michael Dukakis was 10 points ahead of George Herbert Walker Bush at this time in 1988. Mr. Trump is going to lose this election. Uh, Joe Biden will get reelected, and that will be generally good for the markets, uh, which are at an all-time high, I might point out, during the Biden administration. 
but it'll also be very good for Bitcoiners because you may not like the regulation coming out, but at least there's a predictable process to the law and we'll continue to beat the Biden administration uh, in the court system of the United States. Uh, and so I, I just want to remind people of that. Moreover, I think the Democrats are finally getting the message. Even Elizabeth Warren herself is starting to get uptight about the 73 million Bitcoin or crypto wallets that are in America right now. Anthony, it was great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for your taking the time Good. to share your insight. Appreciate it. Good to be on. Thank you, guys. And coming up, newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to get analysts insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around. More market domination still to come. It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. More than 150 companies went public in 2023, giving the market a fresh slate of names in which to invest. We're taking a closer look at which companies are worth adding to your portfolio and which are better left behind. I'm here with John Keaton, Torch Capital founder and managing partner, and you actually invested in an older IPO, Sweet Green, from 2021. Your goodbye today is in a similar space. We're talking about Kava, the Mediterranean sort of fast casual chain. The stock's actually done pretty well since the IPO. And your first reason is you say it's a strong brand. Completely. Brand is critical and they sit in a really interesting spot of Mediterranean cuisine, which is healthy, delicious and fast. 
And as, I, as you mentioned, you know, we were early investors in Sweetgreen, mm -hmm. which has also proven mass adoption of healthier options, fast, casual, healthier options are growing like crazy. And, and the sort of knowledge of Kava, since it's become public, it's also opened a lot of new locations, has been pretty good. Absolutely. Both companies are growing like crazy. Um, but Kava has really established itself, you know, differentiated. There aren't that many players in this space. Mm -hmm. And Kava's performed well and is beloved by people. And let's talk about the financial performance as well and what you see as the growth pot potential for the company. So they've done it. The management team has done an excellent job. Uh, it's profitable, EBITDA positive. They've been growing. They grew 20% uh, in the last year. Uh, that looks like it's going to continue. And we think uh, we still think there's, there's huge tailwinds behind this. I mean, I think with the advent of healthier options, uh, we're seeing people want that. But more importantly, there's other tailwinds behind this. Like mm -hmm. we've been hearing all about the miracle drugs of GLP-1s to treat obesity, whether it's Ozempic or Wegovy. Well, that's growing like crazy as well. And they're, they're proving to be accelerators for behavioral change, which means even if people weren't as interested before, if they're on these medications, they will be more interested now. And we have a company, Ro, uh, which is a full stack telemedicine treatment. They treat obesity. And we're seeing the numbers are insane about how quickly they're growing. If a patient qualifies for obesity, they can even get the medication without leaving their home. And so that just shows, that's just a simple signal of how big this is going to be. So there's sort of consumer sentiment positive, but there's also real change in the market, and which will create more behavioral change. And then the third point, and this is something you alluded to, is the management team at Kava, which you say is a, is a strong one. Very strong team. Again, it shows how disciplined they were, uh, and they've continued to be with revenue growth and their, their margin increases. Uh, their COO came from Taco Bell, where she was a total star in, in excellence of operations. So it's a great asset to have in their team. The CEOs had a very clear vision for the brand and what they're doing. And so it's really, we feel it's all steam ahead on this company. So we'd like to talk about what are the potential risks to the upside, right? And in this case, it's perhaps just overall weakness in consumer spending. Kava is not seen as sort of a value offering, right? No, it's, it's not. The price point's a little bit higher. So is that why it, it would potentially be vulnerable? Exactly. So as any sort of higher cost good, considered sort of a luxury spend in the, in the casual, fast casual space, that could put it at risk. But that said, if that's more medium and short term, but long term with the tailwinds, with the strong management company, with the strong growth uh, and, and the strong brand, we, we still feel very positive about this company. Okay, so that is your goodbye. Let's talk about the one that you would say investors maybe should avoid, and that's Birkenstock, another IPO from last year. That one has been a little bit rockier stock-wise. And Kawa, first reason you don't like it, high valuation. Totally. So I think it's a great company, mm -hmm. but it's trading at an enormous P-to-E ratio, uh, way above its peers, um, about 4x premium compared to the average 17 of uh, 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 17 PD ratio of, of competitors in the space or other footwear brands. Um, on top of that, growth has uh, slowed. I mean, they, they grew pretty well last year. Mm -hmm. they, their Q4 sales exceeded expectations, but the margins, they were negative. So the stock got hit a week ago when that came out in the earnings mm -hmm. call. It's rebounding a bit today. But we think overall they're guiding only 8% growth, which is down. Um, and so they, they have some work to do. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit more about that limited growth that you're talking about compared with the industry. So this is what analysts are projecting yep. will be uh, their annual growth, 8.3%, but the industry average projected at 11. What, what's, what, what gives there? What, why are we seeing that kind of a gap? I think they came out really strong uh, and they sort of saturated their existing market, which would will in a second take us to why I think, what could turn them around. But look, they haven't, they innovated a ton to get to where they are and they, they re, recalibrated the brand and that was shown in the IPO uh, and that was valued in the IPO. But now they got to do something next. And I think existing, uh, their existing performance is also very much at uh, the mercy of retail, like 70% is wholesale uh, wholesalers. And wholesalers have their own pressures on margin, mm -hmm. and so they can't control their own destiny either. So that's also another potential pressure. And as we come up back to pessimistic consumer sentiment, even though yeah, inflation let's go to that. Yeah. is, uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, even though inflation has come down, we think the consumer sentiment is, uh, consumer price index is still up 3%, and consumer sentiment is still not where it needs to be for, again, a luxury good. You know, I have to say, I usually don't weigh in on these, but one thing that you did include that I thought was intriguing that we've seen a lot with Birkenstock, and I say this as a Birkenstock owner, 
there are a lot of Birkenstock knockoffs out there as well, and some of them at cheaper price points. And so I wonder at what point that also totally can cannibalize their own. You know, they created a category that became right. fashionable, but that also makes them potentially victim Vulnerable. to that cannibalization. Exactly. All right, let's talk about what could go right. And you did allude to this, which is innovation. Like, what's the next innovation in hippie sandals? <laughs> well, I think they have to think beyond that. Uh, they are. They basically made sort of awkward, comfortable sandals cool and popular, I think they should be able to do the same as sneakers. I mean, look, mm -hmm. uh, hookahs have become fashionable. Uh, you know, New Balance was like a dad shoe and it rose like a phoenix from the ashes, yeah. becoming cool for kids all over the country. So they've already done that in another category. They should be able to cross over in that category. But either way, if they add more creativity and add more innovation, which help re you know, re restart the brand in general. Mm -hmm. If they can do that in another category, I would feel very differently about this. Okay, well, we'll watch that to see if it happens. But in the meantime, let's sum up what you're telling investors. And we should say, by the way, you don't have a position in either of these I stocks. Have no correct? positions in either of these All companies. All right, it's just what you have observed. So you're telling investors, buy Kava based on its strong brand, strong financial performance, and experienced management team. On the other side, avoid Birkenstock, high valuation, limited growth potential, and the mixed picture on consumer spending. Unless we get maybe a Birkenstock dad sneaker. Watch this space, yeah, we'll yeah. see. We'll be looking for it. All right, that'll do it for Goodbye or Goodbye. Well, we bring you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, John. Thanks, Julie. Less than 30 minutes away now from the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's check in on a few trending tickers. Macy's shares on track to finish the day higher here. It's after it received a second buyout bid offer from Arc House Management and its partner, Brigade Capital Management. Brooke De Palma is here with the very latest details. Brooke. Good afternoon, Josh. Macy's review of the second buyout bid from activist shareholders Arc House Management and Brigade Capital Management for $6.6 .6 billion is underway. Now, this offer would take the company private at $24 a share. That's a 14% premium from its original proposal of $21 per share and a 33% premium to where shares close on Friday. Now, in a note to clients, one city analyst in the neutral rating on the retailer said that Macy's is likely to more seriously consider this offer. And this new t uh, price tag demonstrates Arc House's conviction to make this deal happen. Now, this does come less than one week after Macy's laid out a growth strategy, which new CEO Tony Spring told Yahoo Finance will allow it to unlock a much more compelling story for Macy's. While Arc House Managing Director Gabriel Kahani told Yahoo Finance he believes while Macy's is focused on marginal improvements, the company is melting away. And while there's been speculation that Arc House is only in it for the real estate, Gabriel told Yahoo Finance it wants to give shareholders a premium and lean into both retail and real estate. Thanks, Brooke. Appreciate it. Well, shares of Super Microcomputer and Decker's Outdoor, both in the green today after an announcement that the stocks are set to join the S&P 500, replacing Whirlpool and Zion's Bank. Uh, Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer joining us now to talk about how and why these moves are being made. And a little bit of surprise, because like Super Micro has zoomed out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, no, so there's qualifications, right, yeah. to come into the S&P 500, and essentially, in some ways, you graduate from that mid-cap index, right, because what we're seeing with Supermicro here, largely because of their market capitalization. The market capitalization in Supermicro has absolutely taken off over the last year as this stock has roared. You're looking at the market cap there, sitting at about $63 billion today. Now, you need a market cap of just south of $16 billion to get into the S&P 500. And when you really look at that chart there, it's almost hard to see because of how long it was in that range. But Supermicro was essentially not market cap eligible for the S&P 500 until almost this year. Like, it just happened this yeah. year in this stock rise that we've seen. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, guys, too, when we think about the two stock moves that we saw today, it's very normal for your stock to rise when it's announced that you're going to enter the S&P 500. Take a look at Uber shares, right? I've been doing really well. But when you look at Supermicro, up 23% today. Deckers is up 2%. It gives you an idea of just the AI enthusiasm that you see when you have similar news, right? We have the same news for both of these companies. Decker's Outdoors has been a great growth story, going to be in the S&P 500. Investors normally get excited about that kind of thing. Not nearly as excited as they're going to be for an AI company to come into the S&P 500. Guys, Super microcomputers up about a thousand percent now mm -hmm. over the last year. It just is. It's pretty astonishing. With a market cap, by the way, just to put sixty billion in perspective, that's the same as FedEx, roughly. 
That's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. incredible. Uggs. Uggs also, but I guess not as exciting to people. <laughs> All right, thanks, Josh. Let's get to our call of the day. Shares of Lyft and DoorDash get a boost after RBC Capital upgrades both stocks from sector perform to outperform. The firm not only looking at the names on their separate merits, but also considering the option of a potential partnership. RBC Capital Markets equity analyst Brad Erickson joining us now to discuss. Hey, Brad, it's great to see you. So you're talking about some kind of potential loyalty program here. What would that look like? Yeah, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me on. So. I think what we were thinking was, you know, you've got you've got these two great brands, right? Dash Pass is 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 a 15 million uh, user brand, basically half of, De- of DoorDash's business. In the U.S. Lyft Pink is quite small, but still, you know, a couple million on 24 million Lyft users. Uber One has clearly proven out that cross loyalty works as a platform, and these two effectively are offering, in theory lower a, a worse value prop today 10 bucks a month for only the ride hailing side 10 bucks a month only for the for delivery side coming together they don't need to merge right everybody's been talking about you know should doordash buy lift or or what have you they don't need to merge just work together and get access cross pollinate to each other's customer bases we think makes a lot of sense and Brad, just to clarify for viewers, though, too, even if this, you know, potential partnership you're talking about, even if it didn't happen, you still like both names, right? We do. We do. Yeah. I mean, different calls, obviously. Uh, on Lyft, we just we, we do a proprietary analysis that's uh, basically got a lot better for Lyft as of last August and has continued to improve. We think they're operating on relative equal footing now, meaning meaning competing with Uber. They're still at a disadvantage market share wise but they're stable to the degree that that continues to play out. We think there's potentially a lot of upside. The stock is not priced for them to compete with Uber. Uh, on the DoorDash front, it's a, it's an even simpler call where we just think numbers are too low. We, th- we like the fact that, it, you know, the way that somebody starts out ordering a DoorDash, say once a month or twice a year or whatever, that frequency has shown a continuous ability to, to grow predictably betting against DoorDash here is like betting against the macro from a consumer slowdown standpoint. And again, we think numbers are going to be moving up and that's not appreciated. Um, Brad, what is the likelihood that these two do get together on some kind of partnership? I mean, near term, probably pretty unlikely, right? This is us out speculating and, and doing a lot of spreadsheet math and so forth. We did get asked the question frequently this morning of, you know why? Why do we suddenly believe this? Have we heard it? Obviously, we've heard nothing to support this. Um, we'll see. Companies are both at conferences here today and tomorrow. They may comment on it. We'll see. So we don't expect anything imminently, but we we call out the optionality. Right? This is a free call option in the stock, and to the degree that they do get together, poses a, an incremental competitive risk for Uber, and 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 should enable both of these players to compete better in 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 these markets. You know, Brad, I also had a question about the ride hailing market. It's interesting how investors sort of, they often kind of characterize it or sort of frame the stories. You would often hear about Lyft. Well, you know, it was sort of like the domestic pure play and some would argue, you know, Uber is the smarter play because it's more diversified. I'm just interested to get your take. How do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's still the the single, uh, single product platform, if you will, and that's not changing. And certainly in the US, Uber has been the better play. The stock has worked tremendously well uh, on up through index inclusion, which I think you guys just talked about in the prior segment. Um, I, again, I think with with Lyft operating on equal footing, they're trading at a sig- basically half the valuation that Uber is. So I think, again, the market's well aware and ascribing the value uh, to Uber that it's not willing to give to Lyft. We're just saying that if things can get marginally better and then potentially add on this this optionality of getting together with DoorDash on some type of partnership over time, that could be a lot of upside. Um, but yeah, Uber is still has the you know cross geo cross platform uh, value prop, which is which is amazing. Brad, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. You guys too. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Coming up with Nvidia set to close at another all-time high, investors may start to worry that a tech bubble is brewing. We'll speak to a panel of experts about how to play the Magnificent Seven and beyond, for that matter, on the other side.
Welcome back to Market Domination. We're just minutes away here from the closing bell on Wall Street. Just before that, we're here to break down the best plays for your portfolio with the Yahoo Finance Playbook. And today, tomorrow, and long term, with the help of some industry experts, today we're going to be focusing on the tech sector. Check out NVIDIA. It is reaching an all-time high here. That's after hitting the $2 trillion market cap and raising optimism for other tech stocks, but also has raised some concerns of potential bubble, which could spook investors. We're here with Ray Wang, Constellation Research's principal analyst, founder, and John Blackledge, TD Cowan's managing director. Fellas, welcome both of you to the show. Ray, maybe I'll start with you and, and with that question, Ray, about NVIDIA, where this remarkable rally continues. Ray, Bloomberg is noted here, NVIDIA has now leapt past Aramco in market value, which means it is the world's third most valuable public company. You see a move like that, Ray, and some people do begin to raise questions about maybe perhaps what we're seeing here is the kind of classic AI bubble. Is that what you're seeing, Ray, or, or no? You think this, this move makes sense? We are definitely not saying that. We are saying this as the beginning of the second inning of the biggest AI boom ever. And this is the age of AI, and NVIDIA is leading the way. They've got a 24-month lead on chips. No one can catch up yet. They've got a lock-in at the CUDA level, which is their software that accesses the chips. And they've got partnerships that are basically showing where their future investments are going to be. So it's got a long way to go, um, at least 24 months before a competitor can catch up to them. And so the question isn't, do you invest in NVIDIA or not? The question is, what else do you invest with NVIDIA? Well, I, and that is a great question. John, I want to take that question to you because um, if you were looking to sort of capitalize on the AI enthusiasm here, and not just yeah. directly, but sort of how it's going to benefit various ecosystems, in your coverage, yeah. who do you think is sort of best poised? Yeah, you have um, obviously Amazon with their uh, AWS, their cloud business, obviously Alphabet, um, Google uh, should uh, be a leader in this. We For Gen AI, we do not think it'll be a zero-sum game. There's going to be multiple players that benefit. And so we have uh, Amazon and Alphabet and then Meta as well. The one difference with Meta relative to Alphabet and Amazon is they don't have a cloud business. Uh, but if you look at it, um, just tallying it up, the AWS uh, CapEx plus Google's CapEx plus Meta's CapEx this year, we have it at about $115 billion, up about 35% uh, year over year. And so they're investing significantly ahead of, you know, you know, Ray was just saying, you know, just this big boom um, of generative AI. Uh, and I, I also believe we're really early. Um, these companies are going to be very well positioned. Uh, and so they're spending ahead on capacity uh, for the generative AI solutions that they're going to offer companies and, and consumers. And Ray, another name I want to get your take on here um, is Apple. And you know, Ray, it's a down about 10% so far this year. I think in part there are investors who are worried about Tim Cook's AI strategy. And you know, Ray, I, I know Apple would say, "Listen, we do integrate that technology across our portfolio." They would point to, you know, features like predictive text. But I think you know, Ray, investors want more. They want some new Gen AI product that is just going to blow away consumers. Do you think that's coming, Ray? And if so, when? Well, if there's going to be any announcement, it's going to happen in the Worldwide Developer Conference that typically happens in the June timeframe. I don't have any additional knowledge as to what they would announce, but they've got a couple of things that they gave sneak peeks on. Apple Ferret is a very interesting piece. It's an open source library approach in terms of doing visuals and text. Uh, and that's one of the things that they've put out as a language model that people can start to play with. There's some traction that I see, especially among college kids and people in the university that are testing that to see what they can do. Uh, and then, of course, if you think about Apple and the other areas, I mean, they've got the chips. They're already in the chip game and they've got AI built into their chips. So I don't know what other story they have to tell investors, but it's been in the back and they're really ambient experiences, but investors aren't buying it. Uh, and that's part of the challenge. Ray, of course, we also had that big EU fine that was levied against Apple today. And um, I wonder how much of a concern you think that is for Apple and for other companies that are going to be subject to, in particular, EU regulation. Yeah, the challenge with AI and regulatory bodies is that this is the opportunity for, you know, an aspiring politician to save the world and help us with privacy and stop big tech. Uh, and 
without understanding the cost benefit analysis of what they're going up against. And so you're going to see a lot more regulatory pressure and headwinds uh, that are, I mean, headwinds that are going to affect a lot of these tech companies, especially as government wants to get involved in the regulatory aspect of AI, because tech is one of the few industries that is so lightly regulated compared to everything else. Um, John, I want to follow up with you about that because, of course, the, these regulatory pressures are not just affecting Apple. They're affecting a lot of the other companies. That Digital Markets Act, uh, the deadline for which is Wednesday. There are some changes that uh, some of these companies are going to have to make. Is, are, are any, is any of that going to be material? Thus far, it has not really proven to be. One of the things with, the, with generative AI um, on the regulatory side, which I think is is kind of interesting is, uh, you, you know, the, the the folks that created these like GPT-3 and GPT-4, they didn't exactly know what, they didn't know it could speak Italian, they didn't know it could code so well. And that's one of the issues that I've seen just intend, attending conferences over the last year, seeing government officials saying, hey, we don't know if we can use this uh, because we don't know what it's going to create on the other side of it. So I think it, it is going to be interesting. And I do think the governments around the world have to pr uh, pretty much act quickly uh, uh, because it is going so fast, uh, and just to, just to, uh, to ensure you know kind of sa safe and responsible AI. Ray, I also want to get your take on another issue here. Uh, talking about Alphabet for a second, Ray, which I think you own. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I, I want do. to get your take about the Gemini uh, AI app, Ray, and the kind of you know, at least kind of political uproar we saw about that. It became kind of this running joke on social media. I'm interested, Ray, how much, you know, as, as, as an investor, how much of a black eye you think that was for Alphabet? And did it raise questions for you, Ray, about, you know, its vulnerability here with rivals? Um, there are two things uh, with, the, with the Google Gemini issue and the Alphabet issue. I think the main part was really that, you know, you only get to learn uh, what you train against, right? And you can see biases right away. And I think without the human piece that's built into it, you wouldn't have caught a lot of these kind of errors. Uh, the, the challenge was this. Microsoft started the war before Google was ready. Google had waited a long time. They didn't want to go out with a lot of the of AI until it was perfect. Microsoft jumped the gun on Google, and this is why we have a lot of these interesting issues pop up. There's a lot of training that actually has to happen, and there's a lot of human intervention to be able to do that. And I think we're going to see a lot of these across the board. This will be the one that caught everyone's attention, but I think you're going to see a few more of these pop up because these things aren't perfect. This is Gen I. It's probabilistic. It's not deterministic. You know, one plus one could equal three one day, and we have to go correct that, and that's why human intervention is important. And so this is where transparency is important. Important. versatility is important, the ability to actually understand how to keep training these systems is important, and it's also important to have a human in the loop as you're thinking about these ethical models. Um, John, I know you cover Alphabet and you've got an outperform on that stock, so what is your view of how they have sort of managed through these early days of AI and, and how they're going to do going forward against the likes of Microsoft? Yeah, I mean, Microsoft and OpenAI clearly won the headline battle last year, for sure. Uh, Alphabet, as, as far as I was tracking, right, uh, probably in February, March, started to go faster with it. Um, they had some good announcements at I.O. last year and last May. Obviously, we're just talking about the Gemini launch. Um, and it is going to be a little bit uneven, but I do believe it is there for them uh, to uh, do well and to benefit, like I was saying earlier, with their cloud business uh, for enterprises and small businesses, and then with their Gemini suite of products for consumers. And um, I agree, like there's a lot of, like we've heard from all of our companies I've reported, they're all kind of using generative AI uh, across their companies and for internal functions and whatnot. And we think Alphabet will be there for it, but for sure, I mean, they're, the pressure is definitely on. And, and um, I agree with Ray, these, these uh, LLMs, what they create is not perfect, uh, but I believe that over time, um, Alphabet will, will get it right. It was, de it was definitively, their number one priority this year is to to be the leader in AI, and so it's still early in the year. Um, but it's but yeah, they need to um, you know kind of pick it up a little bit. Ray, John, thank you guys both for joining the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Coming up, it's time for the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned for market domination overtime on the other side.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. Josh and I joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Let's see where the major averages ended up. We see uh, declines across the board here, a little bit deeper than they were just an hour ago. The Nasdaq off by four-tenths of 1%, the S&P off a tenth, and the Dow down a quarter of 1%. Um, so that's what we saw from the major averages, but we continue to see Bitcoin move higher. That's really the big asset that we've been watching on the day, 67,800. While we have seen the major averages move uh, down since we last checked in, we have seen Bitcoin continue to push higher here. Let's move it over to Jerry now for a closer look at today's sector action. Thank you, Julie. And as we've been tracking all day, utilities in the lead. It's up 1.65% into the close. Also, real estate, another interest rate sensitive sector, sector up over 1%. The big losers here, communication services, consumer discretionary, and energy all trading to the downside. We do have some records here. So in Industrials, record high, and tech, guess what? Just missed it by a little bit of a hair there. But let's take a look at some of the sentiment indicators here. Bitcoin by far and away the day's leader here, but also Korean stocks and also uh, SOX. That is a chip stock ETF, SOXX. That notched a record high. That's on the back of an NVIDIA record high. And I know Josh has some words about NVIDIA in a second. Don't want to steal his thunder. So just checking in on some of the losers. It was cannabis and internet stocks over in China. Those were the biggest losers today. I do want to track one sector in particular that overall we're seeing some green in is that is a banking sector. But when we switch over to regional banks, one name in particular is standing out. That is New York Community Bank down an additional 23 percent today. And if we add to that the uh, year to date losses, we're looking at a total of 73 percent and a half of that stock lo lost in value today. So Josh, sending it to you. Well, Jared, you teased it just right. We're going to watch NVIDIA here closing at another record high in today's trade. Let's put just some numbers on what has been a remarkable rally. It is up about 75% already this year. It's added more than $800 billion in value. That means it is now only trailing Apple and Microsoft in market cap. The street here, not worried at all about the kind of move we've seen. Still in love with this name. Nearly 90% still have a buy on it right now. No sales. Not a single one on NVIDIA. Investors love this company's last earnings report. Julian, the bet clearly that it's just incredible sales growth. Their betting is going to continue. And we just talked to Ray Wong. He loves the stock still, too. In fact, I don't think that we have talked to anyone in the past few weeks who have said they don't like NVIDIA, have yeah, we? I'm not, sure I we think... I'm not sure we found one that's even neutral on the sidelines at this point. Yeah. And important, in part, I think it's, it's you know, what you mentioned, Ray. I think he makes a case that we've heard a lot, at least from the Bulls, which is we talk about competition. And Ray's point is, yes, I mean, obviously, you see a move like that. It brings in the competition, AMD and, and Intel and even NVIDIA's and own in, customers. And in-house chips, Yeah, too, right? like exactly. the big cloud giants. But at least Ray making the case, pounding the table, NVIDIA is just too far ahead at this point. There's a lot of table pounding. Going a lot. Down. Tremendous <laughs> amount of pounding. Yeah. All right, joining us now with his key takeaways from the trading day, Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sassi. I'm pounding the table on market domination. There we go, wow. guys. I really, look, I totally hear what you were saying on Ray <laughs> Wong. I mean, super knowledgeable guy. Very much enjoyed listening to him in, in the green room. But I think he came away, or I came in with the sense, if I'm an investor on this platform, that NVIDIA is going to go up every single day. NVIDIA, uh, it took about 180 trading days for NVIDIA to go from a $1 trillion market cap to a trillion, mm -hmm. $2 trillion market cap. News like, none of that is normal. And not every single day you're going to see NVIDIA rise about 6% like we're seeing on today, se today's session. And that is my theme uh, for this segment here. There are have been a couple warning signs uh, on this AI trade. She said, nobody gives a damn and nobody wants to talk about it. So that's why I'm highlighting it. HPE, out earnings last week. The stock was hammered. Sales down 14%. They're warning about people being unable to install their AI infrastructure. Where's the power? Where's the energy? All this stuff is overheating. How do you install this stuff on the premise and make a lot of money for it? Uh, warnings flag. Number two, HP. Uh, that's HP Inc. They sell PCs. Unwilling to bake in to their back half of the year outlook, uh, what AI PCs could mean to their top line. They didn't come out. They didn't come out and say, we're thinking we're going to see an explosion in AI PCs. Why? Because nobody knows. And then last but not least, this week, I would keep a careful eye on Salesforce. 
they have a, a, a product demo day where they're supposed to unveil a lot of AI, but when they talked about this, guys, on their earnings call this week, everybody shrugged it off. Maybe the market didn't want to hear about any more AI tools from Salesforce, or they were unwilling to bake in a profit expectation from new AI tools. Whatever the case, there are red flags out there. AI stocks do not go up every single day, so I hear what Ray Wong was saying. Appreciate him coming on our big show launch, but there are things, uh, concerns investors need to be watching here. Could you say, though, Brian Sazi, mm -hmm. And you're making a very good point. You got to stay, uh, saying, stay, work here. stay nimble. <laughs> let, me, let me get this though. Could you say, if I was going to channel my inner AI bull, okay, go. I would say, okay, you're, you're pulling out HPE yep. and, and Mr. Benioff. Yep. I could look at Mr. Dell, who yep. somewhere in Texas probably is smiling really well, broadly. They're selling PCs. I didn't even know but, Dell still made but, but this, uh, servers. But this was the, I mean, they not only beat, and they gave you that guidance, yep. which easily beat consensus, and in part, that was positive AI trends. It was. Look. It's going to take time, I think, for a lot of this AI infrastructure to be built out. This notion that you can come out here and, and you can grow your backlog and these stocks are going up a straight line like they did last year. I think there are starting to be some real concerns around if that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what I'm saying this week. Now, I think one of the real tells on this move, if Salesforce comes out this week, Josh, and it outlines a host of new AI tools and reveals some pricing, which when they reveal pricing last year for the AI tools, it sent the stock higher. If they come out with these things and the market yawns, I think that's a big, big red flag to the AI trade. And then, uh, really, I think you have to watch what the Fed says this week, too. If they don't give an indication on what they may do with rates this year, if they agree with what Torsten Slock over at Apollo, which mm -hmm. is uh, our parent company, if they no come cuts. out, they're no not, cuts, they're not going to blow up the AI trade. They're not going to do that. They can at least signal one word can blow up this AI trade if Jerome Powell. They're not going to signal that they're not cutting rates this year. Well, you, if you they do, that, you know that, that AI trade goes up of in course. smoke. Yes, and, I, and if I, But if there's you know, one rate hike, <laughs> if, there's, if there's one rate cut, I think that would blow up the AI trade. I think a large part that is fueling this AI trade is the fact that we might get two or three mm. rate cuts this year. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, that this trade can go up completely in smoke. Mm. Congrats on the show launch. It's great yeah, to be here. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Sasha. Appreciate you guys. Good to have you here. All right, let's take a look now at how to balance big tech in your portfolio. Joining us now, Gargi Chaudhry, who is BlackRock America's iShares investment strategy head. Gargi, it's good to see you here. Um, you heard what we were discussing and what we have been discussing about uh, big tech here. And there has been some increasing discussion as of late uh, about the B word, the bubble word, right? Um, and it seems as though the bulk of strategists are coming out and saying, this is not a bubble. We're not there yet that they're not seeing those characteristics. How are you thinking about tech and whether we're there? Good afternoon, Julie and Josh. It's great to be here. Congratulations on your new show. Very exciting. Um, so uh, first things first, I think that, you know, we think broadly about the growth and quality space. So, you know, as you and I have discussed before, obviously AI is huge. It's a mega trend that we are focusing on, but really investors are much more thoughtful around adding quality in their portfolio. So that's what we have seen garner a tremendous amount of inflows. And again, when we talk about quality, what we do mean is some of those characteristics that AI companies tend to have, which is very strong and stable earnings, which is low leverage, which is a lot of excess cash flows. And I think all of those are in vogue now. I think even in a world where the Fed, and this is not the base case, but even if we can envision a world where the Fed probably just goes a few less times than what is priced in the market right now, I think that still bodes well for the quality as well as the large cap theme, which is what we like. And you also call it specifically, Garge, you, you, you see opportunity what you call lovable laggards. What, yeah. is that, what does that mean, Garge, exactly? Which sectors fit that criteria? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when we came out with our year ahead outlook, which was back in December, uh, the two areas that we felt that were most likely to catch up to the rest of the market were financials and healthcare. And with the reason that we chose each of them were, were a little bit different. For financials, it was very much around that pro-cyclical move. It was around our expectation that the yield curve may steepen a little bit or at least not continue to flatten. For healthcare, it was very much about the expectations of growth. Obviously, the first couple of months of the year, we've seen healthcare do very well, keep up with the S&P financials as well. Uh, we still do think, actually, there's a little bit more room to run there, especially if we continue to believe 
that a steepening or at least a lack of flattening is in the stores for us for the next couple of months as well. So the lovable laggards, areas that investors haven't really reached into in terms of flows or you know when we look at flows, it, it's what reveals to us as really under owned continue to be that healthcare and financials and the growth dynamics, uh, earnings growth dynamics, especially for healthcare, uh, you know, sort of beginning to turn in the second quarter or so of this year. Um, Gargi, how closely, you know, we were just talking about rate cuts and how many are happening and when they're happening. One would have to think that one of the groups where it really does matter is in the financials. Or do you think that that relationship is less important than it used to be because the, the financials have gotten somewhat more diversified. Yeah, number one, they've gotten more diversified. I would argue that they're a lot more higher quality, at least banks and uh, you know insurers are. However, having said all of that, if there's any reason for us to believe, and I, I know, um, I think Brian was talking about this earlier in terms of what we may or may not get from the Fed, if there's any reason for us to believe that the next move from them is not a cut, whenever that comes, but if there's any reason for us to believe that the next move is not a cut. I think that can certainly, you know, sort of hamper some um, uh, some excitement that we've had around financials. But for now, the two ways in which we can, you know, with the quality being the core, quality and large cap, uh, you know, we look at the tickers QUAL and IWY as the core of your portfolio. I think the the satellite, if you will, can still be the healthcare and financial sectors based on our view of the Fed and our view on earnings. And, and Gargi, I'll get, I'll get you out of here on this, kind of a broader question, Gargi. With rates steady and, and you know, corporate earnings season, it's largely behind us. What do you think, Gargi, mm -hmm. a, a potential catalyst is for the market in kind of just the near intermediate term here, next, next few months? I think a couple of things. Number one, I think we have con we have so far seen growth expectations, whether they come from sort of the strength we're seeing on the consumer side, on the consumer balance sheet side, whether it comes to jobs, all of that has been better than expected, right? So if that changes, if the dynamic around, if uh, a dynamic around the labor market strength. Uh, or the consumer strength begins to change, I think that's certainly something that can be a catalyst for a pullback in the market. Another, of course, is what you guys were discussing before, which is around the reaction function from the Fed. So far, the market still expects that uh, there's going to be approximately three cuts. I think if we get inflation data that questions that view, if we get sustained inflation rates, not one print in January or one print in February, but if we get sustained super core, which is of course the core X shelter that continues to move higher, I think that can be something that uh, will take a little bit of time for the market to digest. Look, so far, higher yields have not hampered equities, which is great because higher yields have come about because of an expectation of higher growth. To the extent we move away from that and higher yields is, an expect is as a result of expectation of inflation but not growth, I think that does bring some concern to equity investors, at least in the short term. In the longer term, I think the fundamentals look very solid, especially for quality and growth companies. Like the Fed said, we need more good data. We'll see if we end up getting it. Gargi, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Apple was hit with a $2 billion fine today by the EU for thwarting competition rules. We'll dive into the details and what it means for the tech giant on the other side.
A slew of retailers expected to report their latest quarterly results this week. The financial reports to provide a clearer view on consumers as they proved to be more resilient than many had expected. Here with how the retailers are measuring up to the shifting retail landscape, we have Storch Advisor CEO Jerry Storch. Jerry, it is always good to have you on the show. So we got some big retail names on deck. Jerry, I'm just curious, you know, what you expect to hear from these companies. You know, viewers who are watching right now, they may have some money committed to these real retail names. Jerry, what, what do you think they're going to here? Well, look, uh, so far the consumer has held up pretty well, better than most people expected, including me. However, the stresses are still there. The reason that they're spending less on discretionary purchases, it's still there. You know, inflation is still real. Uh, you know, the the uh, stress on the consumer balance sheet is still real. So we're all watching these results with a, with a very sharp eye. So far, a number of retailers have reported last week and, and uh, especially. And what we've seen is kind of a mixed pattern. Those that had negative same store sales in the third quarter were still negative in the fourth quarter. It's not like they flipped into suddenly being positive. They were a little better, but not much. And those that were positive in the third quarter were still positive in the fourth quarter, but a little less positive. So something like a Walmart, for example, still good numbers, but not quite as good as a third quarter. TJX, similar, you know, nice numbers, but not quite as good as a third quarter. So what we haven't seen is a real breakout here. Nobody, not one major retailer has flipped from having negative comp sales in the third quarter to positive in the fourth or the other way around. The patterns have been holding very true to form. So I would expect more of the same. Target, for example, biggest retailer coming out tomorrow, you know, was negative in the third quarter. They'll be negative single digits again in this quarter if the pattern holds. We're all watching to see. Is it a little better than that, a little worse than that? That'll tell us a lot. And is Jerry, it's Julie here. Is there any sort of rhyme or reason? In other words, are we seeing that value continues to do a little bit better here? We've certainly seen on the very opposite side of that, that luxury has held up a little bit better than some had expected. So what kind of themes are you seeing on that level? Well, value is definitely a dominant theme. The, the uh, as I mentioned, Walmart has done well, TJX has done well. These are value players. Costco continues to outperform. It's just a stellar, stellar retailer and does well apparently in all times, but especially when it's a little bit tough out there. Meanwhile, apparel retailers, uh, those with uh, with uh, you know home, uh, uh, building supplies, that kind of discretionary purchase for your home, we've seen those struggle. Interest sensitive categories, those have struggled as well. So so uh, products that you don't have to buy, that you could put off, so-called discretionary spending, has not been strong. People are buying necessities, buying a lot of food, and for that little affordable, you know, fun, it's cosmetics. And so cosmetics companies have done great through the holidays. And I think that's what we're going to see in these numbers. I don't really expect many surprises, but we'll see what we'll see what happens here. And Jerry, I want to switch gears here a bit, talk about another issue, you know, which is this issue of shrink, Jerry, you know, retail theft. I'm wondering how much how much of an issue is it for retailers, Jerry? Can we, can we quantify it? And what should, you know, retailers be doing in response? Well, it's a real issue. I know there's all kinds of debate. It's almost gotten political. Like, oh, no, are you talking about crime? Is that a bad thing? You know, whatever it is. Look, there are several components of shrink. One of them is clearly theft, which is what most people think about when they think about shr uh, shrink. And there are those very publicized incidents where mobs break into stores and take everything off the shelves and, and, and run out. And that's, that's way on the increase. There's no doubt about that. But that's not what most of shrink actually is. Right. A lot of shrink is also when people steal products in a more normal fashion, just shoplifting. Another type of shrink is so-called statistical shrink. That's where it's tough keeping track of inventory, which was a big problem during the pandemic. As you know, all these retailers got inventory way out of whack. And so sometimes it shows up as if the books don't match the actual physical level of inventory but because the books were never right at all. So that's statistical shrink, and that's up to. And the other thing that we've seen is everyone went really heavily to self-checkout as labor costs zoomed. It was hard to find people to staff the stores, and so we all love doing self-checkout. But what we found is retailers, a lot of times, is not very economic for two reasons. Uh, one is that people make mistakes. It's just really hard to, to make sure that you've scanned every item and get it all right and that the, every product is identified properly. And the other is it is easier to steal products when you sort of shuffle that, that uh, ninth item off into the basket without scanning it. So there's a whole bunch of reasons for shrink. It's just not uh, entirely that kind of uh, much, uh, you know, the, the, the cell phone videoed crime wave that we've that we've seen. That's really not most of it. It's all of this put together. It is on the rise. 
It's not insurmountable for most retailers. Some are in more difficult position than others by the nature of what they sell. You sell small leather goods. That's always been a theft issue or a, or a shrink type problem. If you're Costco and you sell giant things in bulk, how the heck, you know, you got people checking receipts at the door. How do you anyone steal anything there? So, so it depends on what kind of retail you are. But it, by and large, this is not an insurmountable issue for retail. It's got a lot of publicity and in some cases justifiably so, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is, can consumers keep spending as their balance sheets become more leveraged? Jerry, we got to leave it there, but we'll to be continue next time. Good to see you. My pleasure. Well, Apple was hit with a $2 billion fine today by the EU for thwarting competition rules. The stock is down, was down today, uh, about 2.5%. The European Commission says the tech giant wielded its dominance through its app store to the detriment of music streaming rivals like Spotify. Alexis Keenan has been following the story. And Alexis, this is a battle that Spotify has been fighting for years. A long time. This case was, this investigation by the EC was initiated by Spotify. They complained that this activity was unfair by Apple. But it was a year ago that we knew that the EC had said that Apple had violated the EU's antitrust laws. It's only now that we're learning of this $2 billion consequence of its actions. And here's how EC czar Marguerite Vestager described the offense. Take a listen. This is illegal, and it has impacted millions of European consumers. Uh, they were not able to make a free choice as to where, how, and at what prices to buy music streaming uh, subscriptions. Now, Apple, of course, disagreed with that in a blog post this morning, saying that the EC failed to uncover any credible evidence of consumer harm. They also noted that Spotify holds now 56 percent of the European music streaming market. Uh, they do also plan to appeal this decision. Um, but also, let's talk about the App Store and its significance in Apple's total revenue stream. In 2023, the company had $383 billion in revenue. And if you look Look at the services category. That's where these app store sales are contained. That also contains this little fuzzy Apple Music, Apple TV. But that revenue bucket comes in at $85 billion. You compare that to iPhone sales that declined in 2023 at $200 billion. That's the big bucket. And then $39, almost $40 billion for the iWatch and AirPods. But certainly here, no drop in the bucket. It's a, still a big, significant and growing sector for Apple, so this is a big deal. And Alexis, we also might, be, you could see Apple getting squeezed here on actually both sides of the Atlantic, right? This might not be the last antitrust case we see. Yeah, so the uh, the word on the street, so to speak, is that the DOJ has been readying an antitrust case against Apple, and that most recently last week had a, what's called a last rights meeting with Jonathan Cantor, uh, head of the DOJ's antitrust department with Apple. And so it's widely expected that there will be an antitrust suit against Apple here in the U.S. But the difference here could be really consequential because that probe is much broader than this EU probe. The U.S. is supposedly looking into the whole ecosystem for Apple. So you have to think about iPhones, the App Store, the iWatch, iMessage, AirTags, and all of the things that fit into that because the idea here is that the ecosystem itself is anti-competitive because all of those systems and softwares and technologies are tied together. Um, also, you have on top of that the EU's Digital Markets Act that takes full effect on Thursday. Apple has already said it will be making some adjustments to open the App Store so that alternate payments uh, that were at issue in this case with the EU and the music streaming apps so that European users will be able to pay outside of the App Store. So that's really the crux of this matter is that Apple is withholding the ability to make payments elsewhere and taking that 30% fee from all the transactions that come through the App Store. All right, a lot to watch from both sides of the Atlantic. Alexis, thank you so much. Time now for What to Watch, Tuesday, March 5th. Starting off with the Fed. We're gonna get some more Fed commentary tomorrow. Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Barr, speaking tomorrow afternoon. Wall Street looking for more clues on rate cuts from Barr's comments leading up to Fed Chair Jerome Powell's two days of congressional testimony later this week. On the earnings front, CrowdStrike, Target, Ross Stores, Box, and Nordstrom all reporting. Target announcing fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings ahead of the open. 
Analysts expect adjusted fourth quarter earnings to come in at $2.40 a share on revenue of $31.35 billion. The big box store, one of many retailers reporting earnings this week. Investors will be watching for the latest barometer on the health of the consumer. And moving over to politics, Super Tuesday happening tomorrow. Largest number of states will be holding presidential primaries or caucuses. More delegates are at stake on tomorrow than on any other single date during the primary campaign. President Biden facing growing concerns about his age. On the Republican side, Nikki Haley still unwilling to concede the nomination to forever President Trump. Trump also securing a legal win today, the Supreme Court ruling that uh, he could remain on Colorado's primary ballot. Julie, what are you watching tomorrow? Um, I'm focusing on uh, Target as well, um, just kind of looking at whether what are we going to hear about the consumer here. Target shares are up almost 6% this year, but that's half the gains that we have seen in shares of Walmart, for example, which is up about 13% year to date. Obviously, you see Target fell about 3% in today's session here. Um, you know, what will they say about shrink? We were just talking about with Jerry Storch, who thinks that they their same store sales trended down before, they're gonna trend down again, but we'll yep. see. I, I think Super Tuesday tomorrow, on my radar, Julie Hyman, 15 contests for Republicans, got 16 for Democrats. Clearly, I mean, listen, neither Biden nor Trump have been you know, too worried about, about the competition, but I do think there's some interesting storylines to watch. Uh, Nikki Haley, questions about, does she kind of mm -hmm. gain any, any traction for Biden? Yes, we saw him, you know, obviously he won the primary in Michigan and easily, but there were some headlines about, you know, um, the number of voters choosing uncommitted rather than Biden. And of course, listen, whoever ends up in that in the White House in January 2025, big implications for traders and investors. Yeah, I think tomorrow's a lot of noise. I don't know that we'll do. learn, I don't think we're going to learn anything we didn't know today. I'm interested. I'm watching. All, All right. right. We'll see. We'll see. It's a bet. We'll see. That's what makes a market, I guess. All right, that'll do it for today's market domination. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance on the other side.
Tesla shares were hit hard today on concerns coming out of China. Yahoo Finance's Prasad Ramani enjoys us out with the details. 7%. That was quite a drop. Yeah, I mean, multi-week lows here since I think mid-February, since last time we saw these levels. Mm -hmm. uh, two things here. Uh, first off, we saw that shipments fell in February, uh, down 16% sequentially to 60,000 units and down 19% from a year ago. What's going on here? Well, we had the Chinese lunar holiday that uh, dropped in February of this year, so that obviously depresses that economic activity and sales, things like that. Tesla also tends to push out their China shipments later in the quarter, so yeah. probably see more of a catch up there in March. But you know that combined with also um, this is low amount, but combined also with, with price cuts we saw uh, Tesla initiate here in, in China uh, of about forty eight hundred dollars for Model Three and Model Y vehicles, based on insurance subsidies, some options discounting, things like that. But both, both of these things point to potentially a slowdown maybe for them in this once hot Chinese EV market. Mm. Let's talk Ford for a second. Uh, reports U.S. sales are up 10.5% year over year. How did that stack up against uh, the competition there? Yeah, you know, con you know, conversely, you see Ford shares up a lot today mm -hmm. compared to compared to Tesla, and they had a, on a strong quarter, 10 10 percent plus sales gains there. But also, I, I want to note that Toyota, even though they finished behind them, also had a big uh, big month for them for themselves. They were up, I believe, 16 percent. You had Hyundai up six percent. Uh, Kia down a little bit, but but both Honda and Kia saw strong EV sales, and then also Honda uh, up 37.8% in February. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it is compared to last year when these Japanese automakers had some supply issues and, and things like that, but again, it, it kind of shows you that maybe the U.S. auto market is more resilient than we think it is uh, heading into what could be, there was some uncertainty there with high prices and interest rates. Maybe so, interesting stuff. Thanks, Pras. Mm -hmm. Well, a degree may no longer be key to getting a dream job. A recent report from Indeed found that education requirements are gradually disappearing from job postings. In January, less than one in five worlds shared on Indeed's site required a four-year degree. Here with more on the report's findings and what it means for the broader labor market, we're joined by Corey Staley, Indeed Hiring Lab economist. Hey, Corey, so this is very interesting, right? Because some data points that you see say you need a college degree for almost everything. So how should we sort of interpret this? Yeah, this report was really interesting because we found that overall, over half of the jobs on Indeed site don't have a college degree requirement. And what's most notable about that is that we've also seen a pretty significant pullback in the job postings that actually do have degree requirements. So if we look back a few years ago, over 20% of jobs had a bachelor's degree or above requirement, but that number has fallen now to closer to 17%. And so we started to see employers gradually take these types of degree requirements out of job postings, and rather they've been replacing it more with kind of some of the skills and things that they're looking for in these types of postings. And this formal education requirement, the fact that it's declining, Corey, is that is that more prevalent in some sectors than others, or, or no, it's really across most sectors at this point? It's been really across all sectors, but it has been most notable in the areas where education requirements have typically been the highest. You know, there's more opportunity to reduce requirements where those requirements have been higher, but it was really notable that we had over 80% of the sectors that we look at uh, reduce their requirements in the last few years. So it really has been pretty broad based in terms of employers pulling these types of requirements back to attract more workers into these jobs. Now, when it gets to be interview time, are they going to, you know, in other words, are they not putting these requirements in to just cast a wider net, but ultimately they're going to choose folks who have the degrees? That's such an important question. And some of the research um, that's been done um, otherwise has really shown that really it's a good first step to have these types of uh, educational requirements fall out of these job postings where it makes sense. But then there's still a piece of really the rubber meeting the road that has to happen. It's one thing for a company to say, we're going to remove degree requirements. It's a whole nother thing for the hiring managers in these jobs to actually make the decision to choose somebody who has the skills for the job, but not necessarily the formal education. Uh, and there are still so many jobs out there that really could have some of those requirements pulled back. Um, but there are, you know, long standing kind of biases towards those types of candidates with education um, that will continue to have to watch in the coming years. And what skills, Corey, are on your platform have you seen kind of a jump in, in demand for? 
some of the biggest skills, unsurprisingly, given uh, everything we've heard over the last year, have been for generative AI skills. We've seen the number of job postings mentioning generative AI skills grow from pretty much zero last year to now being present in about one in every thousand jobs. So it's still a pretty small number of overall postings when we talk about one in a thousand. But when you consider that that was zero last year, um, we're really seeing a hockey stick style growth for those types of job postings. Beyond that though, um, uh, as we look outside of kind of the tech type skills that are typically talked about, there are still a lot of in-person type of skills that are really important that we see employers asking for um, around childcare and working in dentist office that are still really vital in the labor market today. Corey, what are the implications of what you're talking about for the jobs numbers that we're going to get on Friday? You know, it sounds like tightness is still feels like what's bleeding through from a lot of the comments that you're making here. That, that yeah, as we look back at, you know, January's numbers, we saw that 353,000 jobs added. So as we look towards the job numbers this coming week, um, a lot of that gain in January came from seasonal adjustments. Um, so it's likely that we'll see maybe a little bit of a decline there. The question is, how big of a decline? Um, and as people start to look at those numbers, I think the thing that's important to remember here is that when we look at these education requirements being removed, one of the reasons that's happening is because the labor market has remained so resilient that employers have continued to try to find ways to attract workers. And so as we look at the job numbers on Friday, I imagine that you know even if the numbers fall, if we come in at 200,000 jobs as an example, that's still a really strong number and really well above what we need to keep unemployment constant. All right, we'll wait and see. Corey, thanks so much for joining the show today. Thank you so much for having me. And coming up, BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager, has been pumping billions into clean energy companies and infrastructure projects to speak to the company's CIO on the other side about the latest moves in ESG.
ESG investing seems to be getting a new look as the trend faced growing political criticism, but it seems there's still a lot of excitement focused on the E in ESG, just under a new name, transition investing. BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager, has been pumping billions into clean energy companies and infrastructure projects. Its former chief investment officer of sustainable investing is joining us now, Tariq Fancy. Uh, thanks so much for being here. So as we look at the sort of rebrand that this has been getting, um, I guess, first of all, are you surprised by it that, that sort of the industry has seemed to sort of bow to the backlash? Not really. I think the backlash just expedited a process that was probably going to happen anyway. Because the way to think about ESG is that it's an acronym that was created out of a report in 2004 called Who, Win, Who Cares Wins. And it was sort of a UN-affiliated report that made the argument that companies that are responsible will also perform better. Like, think of it like a competitive sport where you say that you know, the clean players will also do much better and score more points. Uh, in practice, uh, you're just it just lumped together a whole bunch of ideas that are not that similar in practice, right? Gender policies, board composition, carbon emissions. And it was largely sort of intended to you know, attract progressives. And I think on the backlash of on, on the back of a backlash against greenwashing, which came from the left, and a backlash against politicizing investment processes that are governed by legal obligations like fiduciary duty coming from the right, this is a natural transition where you just kind of take the parts of ESG that actually somewhat do make sense and dispense with the marketing and kind of move forward. So it sounds like Tariq, you think BlackRock is kind of making a, a smart move here, sort of narrowing its focus, like, oh, okay, we're gonna stay on. We'll stick with climate investing, but you know, corporate behavior, social issues, not so much. I think so. I mean, I think the way to think about BlackRock is it's a massive organization that has all kinds of different investment groups working on different verticals and different geographies, many of whom actually joined the firm through acquisitions, you know, over the you know, 30 some odd years that it went from nothing to the largest investment firm in the world. So a lot of them are doing good work. And a lot of that work actually creates additionality, right? So this additionality means real world impact that would not have otherwise happened. For example, the global renewable power franchise. But the challenge of BlackRock overall is the massive behemoth that also has trillions of dollars of public market vehicles that frankly, you know, if you invest in them, no additional capital goes towards creating something new such as a renewable power plant. It just allows, uh, you know, fund managers that have baskets of already traded markets and uh, shares in secondary markets to create a slightly greener basket, right? So that they can bifurcate the population a bit and, you know, charge a bit of a higher premium price uh, for, you know, the types of commoditized vehicles that progressives like. And now we're seeing anti-ESG funds from the right. But, you know, within what BlackRock and any firm is doing in the ESG space, there are things that are interesting. And I think the ESG backlash has done us the favor of sort of rationalizing that so that the areas that make sense and that people can rely on, we can do more of and we get rid of all the sort of marketing gobbledygook that was often used to just paint commoditized vehicles green so you could get a fee bump. Yeah, I mean, you had greenwashing and rainbow washing, et cetera, right? But at the same time, you also have the S and the G portions of ESG that are also seeing a pullback. And there's not, say, the IRA that is helping um, it spur funding in those areas like there is with renewables, for example. Um, you know, we see reports of companies pulling back on DEI initiatives, for example. So um, what's the risk of that from, I guess, a moral point of view and also an investing point of view? I mean, again, I mean, they're focusing on the E because it's the largest area that capital will move for a giant energy transition globally. Uh, and it's easy to quantify and measure. And frankly, done correctly, it really shouldn't be politicized because even Republicans believe in, you know, protecting the natural environment. Um, but I think the, the S and G are different. I mean, the G, people have known since the 80s that corporate governance was important. People still know that, right? The fact that some UN report came out and coined an acronym didn't really change anything. Uh, and the S, there are there is a lot of wood to chop for society on the S side. But in general, you know, there are some areas such as fair pay, you know, uh, supply chain wages. Those maybe, you know, might lose a, you know, a bit of focus. But I think a lot of the S issues, when you dig into it, are actually cultural issues. And they're ones that may be very important to society, but it's not clear we're an investment vehicle and it can necessarily 
measure or invest better against those or provide more capital to them. And so I think the way we should look at those are still important to society, but we're at least losing the illusion that those should be solved by Larry Fink, right? Because ultimately, you know, if we care about DEI as a society, I don't think DEI policies are the answer, right? I mean, we you would probably tax people who aren't paying their taxes enough, which is pretty much all the billionaires and large managers today. And you'd put that capital into investing in the education of black women and black communities, right? And that would actually make a difference. But DEI has largely been, and I'm attacking it from the left to be clear, largely been performative optics that aligns with identity politics on college campuses, right? It's sort of a corporate marketization of that. And I think the faster the illusion that that actually has a lot of value to society or that you could invest lots of money in it goes away and allows people to think of, you know, these as really societal issues that need to be solved through the good work of, you know, fixing your government, getting money out of politics. The faster that happens, probably the better. And, and Tariq, just broadly speaking, I'm curious, when we talk about ESG investing, um, what, what is the interest level like right now, Tariq, from investors? Is, is it strong or no? We've, we've seen signs of cooling. I think it is strong if you have products that actually create value. So a lot of where I'm starting to focus my attention is where can you link in institutional capital uh, at scale to areas that have real world impact. But the important part about that is you want real impact, not just sort of fake impact. Like it has to be really, you know, additionality in creating something. I think the other thing is very important. It has to be depoliticized. So I think, you know, an area of focus for me is affordable housing. Affordable housing in the U.S. is something critically important. If you can accelerate it and get more money into it, it's a purple issue. It's bipartisan. It's depoliticized. And everyone kind of agrees that we need, to, we need to solve this. I think vehicles like that, where you can show a market return and create more capacity and more movement towards things that everyone, you know, through a common sense lens could agree is important for society, those, I hope, will grow, and that's certainly my focus area. But I think the ones that look like marketing versions, which often, you know, again, like any kind of marketing now, are sort of playing to people's political preferences, uh, those, I think, probably will go away uh, a little bit. And I think that's not a bad thing, right? Because I think if you have a lot of vehicles out there just claiming to, you know, be like if we're trying to flatten the curve in the pandemic, and instead of having doctors telling us, you know, vaccines are important, you had a bunch of people selling horse tranquilizers and a whole bunch of other nonsense on YouTube. You know, it makes it really hard for well-meaning people to say, hey, I have you know, limited time and I have limited money. I want to do the right thing, right? I want to improve my health. I want to flatten the curve. I want to improve society. It's really hard to do that if there's no one actually out there you know, just actually policing what it is to be good, right? If it's just an ESG score that's a, you know, it's very hard to measure and it's, it's sort of blurry, I think you, you just get a situation like now where people sort of pull money out because they're not really sure what it means. Um, but on, on, on the other end of it, you'll probably have different names for it whatever we transition finance or other things. And I, my, my hope is that those vehicles actually do what they say on the tins so people can actually participate and feel comfortable they're not getting ripped off. Tarek, always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. And coming up, a recent poll shows registered voters nationwide are striking a somber tone on the economy. And check in on the latest from DC on the other side.
Despite the U.S. economy showing more resilience than expected, a recent poll shows registered voters nationwide are striking a somber tone on the economy. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here with the details. Rick. Hey, guys. This was from a New York Times Santa College poll over the weekend. They asked the usual put uh, Biden against Trump to see who comes out on top. But they also asked some other questions. You're seeing it there on the screen. 51 percent of people in this poll said the economy is in poor condition. 51%. That was the lowest answer you could give. There was nothing worse than poor. So according to this poll, half of Americans think the economy is about as bad as it can be. And that, that's just completely ridiculous. I mean, we've talked so many times about inflation. We know inflation um, really hurts working families. Their paycheck doesn't go as far. Some people are falling behind. But this is really kind of crazy. And just to, I, I just tried to frame this by putting some other context here. So 61% of Americans, as one example, say they own stocks. And we have been seeing records in the stock market day after day this year. Uh, and those people, you know, that, it's not necessarily making 61% of Americans rich, but people's retirement funds are going up. There's a wealth effect there. So 61% of Americans are getting wealthier just by doing nothing because their stock portfolio is going up. And yet 51% say the economy is in poor condition. I find the same thing if you look at home ownership, for example. I mean, homeowners, if you're lucky enough to own a home, and that is a lot of Americans, uh, guess what? You either refinanced your mortgage at around 3%, which means your housing costs went down sharply, or you 40% of people own their home outright and homes have been going up in value. So this, this data just doesn't square. Um, and I mean, we've been talking for a while. Americans seem more bummed out by a lot than the state of the, uh, the economy warrants. And it just was bugging me again, so I decided to just look into what's going on here, and it's puzzling. Uh, it is puzzling, but Rick, we'll see what the next poll shows. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. Bye, guys. Let's take a look at what's trending after hours. Stitch Fix shares sliding after reported earnings after the close that missed expectations. It also cut its revenue forecast. The clothing company sees full year revenue of up to $1.3 billion. The street had estimated $1.35 billion. Shares of thread up meantime, we're watching those as well. They reported revenue for the fourth quarter that beat analyst estimates, down 6% though. The secondhand retailer reported a total revenue of $81.4 million. That is a 14% increase year over year. In its year end presentation, the company predicted more financial success to come, saying they see the global secondhand market to nearly double by 2027, worth $350 billion. And finally, open source software company GitLab is plunging after its full year guidance for adjusted earnings per share and revenue fell short of analyst expectations. That weak outlook coming after the company beat on the top and bottom line on the fourth quarter, in the fourth quarter on the back of surging AI demand. The stock's performance year to date outpaced the broader market gains boosted by the artificial intelligence rally. Well, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.